Welcome everyone. Um, tonight we'll be talking about real life spend ops with Azure Cosmos DB. So I think most of us by now might have a friend already that's complained about Cosmos in some way that they've accidentally spent $20,000 in one day and <laughs> ruined their reputation, you know. And so from now on everyone knows this guy who sort of nearly broke the company. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is to sort of figure out why that's possible and how it happens and what we can do about it. So we're going to learn about how to do spend tests and then deal with spend bugs. You know, so we can take care of these issues um, before. William Liebenberg, I'm a solution architect here at SS, and I've got a blog site called Azure Gems, and tonight's presentation and code uh, will be available on my GitHub site as well. I've been developing with Azure for quite a few years now, spent most of my time in the, in the cloud space developing solutions for my clients. Uh, but I started programming when I was about five years old on something similar to Commodore 64, and I've been super excited to always be a developer, and I've been doing it for 15 years. Tonight's agenda, I want to cover what is Cosmos DB, why you might want to use it, and uh, how to use it. Then we'll see how, on earth, how Cosmos can actually be really expensive, why Cosmos DB loves your wallet. <laughs> so, and then we'll turn that story around and see how we can make your wallet love Cosmos DB. Got a few things that we can uh, look at when we design our applications to reduce the cost and keep it performant. Then we want to go and see how we can automate this idea of spend ops. What we can do to take our tests and make them work for us to measure how much Cosmos DB is going to cost us. And then just a few items about what the future of spend ops has in store for us. So Cosmos is really cool. Yeah. You keep hearing that it's super fast, it's globally, it uh, scales globally, you know, it's, uh, and you can, it's very simple because there's no relationships you have to deal with like a traditional database. But Cosmos is also not cool because I keep hearing these nightmare stories that it's really expensive. And some people that migrate to it, they, they can't get it to be cheap, they can't get it to perform well, and, you know, it's very hard for them to, to deal with this. Um, so just my journey with Cosmos, Definitely uh, a SQL guy, I've been doing it for a long time. Um, and yeah, for me, migrating to Cosmos was easy. Some of the applications I wrote, uh, it just worked very, very well. There was a new syntax to learn in terms of the same as what we're typically used to. And deploying it was actually quite good. Um, it's, it's quite easy. Azure supports um, the ARM templates, and you can create Cosmos DB, collections, everything. With, with the ARM templates. You can automate all of the, the deployment as well. But when it came to pricing, I was definitely a little bit concerned. Um, and you know, just by looking at the list of features for Cosmos DB, it's globally distributed. It's got horizontal scalability, so it means we can just keep making it go faster and faster. But the throughput, we can control that. So they say it's elastically scalable uh, performance. And Microsoft also has a, a comprehensive SLA where they say they promise that the latency will be in sig single digit figures, so always less than 10 milliseconds. That's cool. And they also uh, guarantee that the availability and the throughput, the performance, is always going to be at an acceptable, acceptable level. And one of the other features of Cosmos DB is multi-model. Uh, and what is that? So uh, in terms of the models, Cosmos supports the document model. And you can use the SQL API or the MongoDB API to work in this uh, document model. There are three others called uh, Cassandra, Gremlin, and Table. So these three APIs, they use th three different models. The uh, column model is sort of for big data scenarios where you have a lot of uh, numbers or a lot of data that can be aggregated. Um, so it's a bit different to how we would normally use a SQL database. Graph database with Gremlin API. This again, you can look, look at data with a different way or how they relate to each other in a different way. They're more like in connections rather than relationships or structure. And key value, this is a very easy lookup tables. If you've used Azure Table Storage before, you can actually uh, back that with Cosmos DB instead of Azure Storage. So instead of um, going directly to Azure Storage, it uses Cosmos. And then you get all the benefits of being globally uh, distributed, and the high performance and the availability. So if you go to the Azure portal and try to use Cosmos DB, you can just write some simple queries. If you look here, you might be used to the syntax, but it's a little bit different. You can see there, 
we're actually using sort of adjacent notation in our SQL queries for selecting the object or the, the fields of information that we want. <coughs> and then, you know, once you run that query, we get our data back, again, as JSON items. Now, what I've learned so far is that I don't need a database administrator anymore. Thing of the past. <laughs> Cosmos actually makes it really easy to build a globally distributed application with literally only a few clicks. You know, compared to SQL Server, the performance I can get out of Cosmos DB is really good and effortless nearly. Uh, and then when it comes to availability, I can just ask Cosmos DB to replicate in one or many more places. You can do that with SQL Server, of course, and it can be very performant as well, but it's a lot more work and you need someone who really knows what they're doing. And Cosmos has been growing in popularity. So last year it won the technology of the year from InfoWorld. That's a fairly big deal. And everyone's got their eyes on Cosmos DB now, so um, you know, definitely uh, get, get onto Cosmos and try it out. Now we don't want to see how we can develop with Cosmos DB. So there's the .NET SDK, currently version 3 is in preview. And compared to version 2, it's a much simpler API. It's a lot less code you actually have to write to get things done. Everything's got better naming, so now everything references Cosmos DB instead of the old name, which was Document DB. And it's got this very cool middleware extensibility, so we are actually able to intercept our requests that before they go to the Cosmos database, we can you know, modify the messages and retrieve the results before sending it back to our application. So it can take good care of some cross-cutting concerns. And it actually has better performance compared to the previous SDK, so it's always nice to have. And we're not limited to .NET. We can use JavaScript with Node, Java itself, Python, or even the REST API. So we can build any application we want and back it with Cosmos DB. So a couple of tips to get started. You need to know there's a few differences between our transactional SQL and the Cosmos Core SQL API. And also that there are no relationships. So because Cosmos DB provides a schemaless uh, database. To help you get started in terms of the um, syntax, there's some cheat sheets available on the uh, Microsoft Cosmos DB site, and that will show you how to use the SQL API, Mongo, Gremlin, etc. They're all there. And then another way to get started is to use some of the ORM frameworks that are available. And one of them is Cosmonaut. So this is a very cool API. You can, uh, it's got a lot of built-in features for you, like pagination, and it, everything's sort of written in a nice, fluent syntax. So uh, it's on GitHub, you can check it out. Pretty cool. And everyone loves Entity Framework. So Entity Framework Core has a Cosmos DB provider, which is currently still in preview. Hopefully it'll get released by the time .NET Core 3 gets released. But to help you get started, uh, Tiago Passos has a, a blog post. It's very cool, very easy to follow, and it helps you get started with Cosmos DB using Entity Framework Core. And it's also worth knowing that there is a Cosmos DB emulator. So you can actually run your tests and develop your application locally for free. Uh, you can run it as a service on your local machine or install the Docker container. Because, and then, yeah, it, it mimics a real Cosmos DB instance. Now I've run some tests and all the numbers I get back from them, is, uh, it matches a real instance, it's, it's very close. They can differ slightly because the, the real instances might be more up to date than the Docker image, but they're very close so far. You can actually run the emulator in Azure DevOps. You, include that <coughs> you can include that in your CI CD pipeline. So all you need to do is to go to the marketplace, find the Cosmos DB emulator, and install it. And you can just run it as a, a task in your, in your build process. So you know, why can Cosmos DB be so expensive? And you know, sort of if you work out, that a single request unit costs 0 0.0000002 US dollars. If you do some more maths, you'd have to have 50 million request units to pay one cent. So it sounds kind of cheap, but why do some people end up being able to spend thousands of dollars in one day? So we have to look at what is a, a request unit. And <clears throat> from the documentation, it is a normalized measurement in terms of how much compute power, disk I.O. and network I.O. goes into resolving your queries. And everything you do in Cosmos DB consumes request units. So when you're reading an item, you're writing a new item, 
updating or deleting items. They all sort of use some amount of uh, request units. And the rate at which we use the request units is our throughput. So the request units per second. So but when you're designing your application uh, and you, know, you have to decide your, how much throughput you need, well, how much do you need? There's no easy way to, to determine this. So you can go to the document DB capacity planner and give it a sample document that you might want to work with. Say how many times you want to create it and update it in your situation. How many copies of this document you'll have in the database. And it'll give you an estimate of the required throughput and the storage that you need. Now, the URL, document DB, uh, that's the old name. And I was hoping that Microsoft would actually update this someday, and they did. And they did it yesterday. <laughs> so there's a brand new capacity planner. It's actually on the uh, Cosmos uh, site itself. It's no longer called document DB. And it's got a little bit more information. So when you decide how many times your document needs to be read and uh, written, it gives you an actual cost a dollar figure there. And the URL is just there. Now it actually says Cosmos instead of document DB. All right, so what do you actually pay for? So we actually pay for the reserved throughput. It's always available, whether we use it or not. So we're asking for this database to be uh, you know, at a certain performance level, and it'll always stay there, whether we add anything or not. And we pay for the storage cost, so the size of our database. Um, and you know, if we look at the example of uh, creating a new database, the minimum or the, sm the smallest size that we can uh, provision is 400 RUs. And at the current sort of th uh, storage and throughput costs, if we work that out, it's about $37 a month. Okay. So now I'm trying to design my application. It's uh, a uh, multi-tenanted blog, we uh, blog website. And yeah, I'm a SQL guy, so I'm trying to map my data types to a table. And pretty quickly you go, hang on, I've got three tables here, authors, blogs, posts. I've created them as containers. But I have to pay $37 for this one, $37 again, and again. So, whoa, it's like $110, and <laughs> my model's not even complete. It's a very simple model. So what's going on? You know, I'm looking at this Cosmos DB. Uh, logo and saying there's something wrong here. All I can see is uh, <laughs> instead of stars, it's dollars. And I say, hey, Microsoft, there's something wrong here. And I've got a good suggestion for you. You need to change the name from Cosmos DB to Cosmos DB. I've never encountered anything like this before, so um, yeah, this makes more sense. Now, in reality, you know, it, it shouldn't be this expensive. You know, why is it so expensive? You know, as developers, we really need to know how to use our tools, and Cosmos is another tool that we can use. If we don't know how to use it properly, we can make mistakes. It can be expensive. All right? So you know, it's the same as when we're doing DevOps. Uh, you know, in my case, I'm now calling it SpendOps, because at every stage in the life cycle, you can make some choices that actually have a direct cost impact to your business. So when you're writing bad code, you might have a, a bug in release that you know, it underperforms. Or uh, when you're run, running your builds and you're unnecessarily building your software, when you could have nougatized a few libraries and reused the compiled code, yeah, you'll be wasting some money there. Same with in testing. You, know, there's, uh, you can write some really flaky tests that uh, either they run too slow, consume too many resources, or they just break and on Wednesdays. You spend a whole day trying to figure it out, and Thursday everything's fine. So you waste that whole day, you don't know why it broke. So in, each, in all the other stages of life cycle, you can definitely have some examples of where you could have saved some money. And then, yeah, so this is the idea of spend ops. We need to be able to monitor how much money we spend and control how much we spend. Okay? So, and that will let us answer two questions. How much is this going to cost me today? And then I'll be able to work out how much is this going to cost me in a month from now. So now we need to look at why or what we can do to make Cosmos DB love our wallets. Oh, no, why our wallets can love Cosmos DB. So we need to look at how Cosmos works and what we can do. So one of the strategies is to use container sharing or co-location. So one container can actually have multiple data types or entity types. And what we do is we just add an ID and a discriminator property to our data types. And in terms of code, it looks like this. We've got a type there or item type and I give it the .NET types full name and just another, an ID field that they're all going to share. And just all my other entity types inherits from the base 
And so they're all going to work the same way. Now, when I'm writing a query to retrieve these items from the database, I actually have to include the item type on the filter, on the where clause. Because it's a no schema or a schemaless database, I can have a mixture of types. And if I don't put in the check for the discriminator, I might get data that's mixed up from different data types. So with a bit of confidence, or I need a bit of confidence, so I add in the item type field, filter on that, and I get back exactly what I expect. So just as an example here, you can see I have on the left a container called site, and all my documents there, the first one is of a type blog, the next one is a user, and the last one is a post. They're all in the same container. So now instead of paying for three containers, I'm paying for one. And you can imagine if you have 100 or 500 containers, um, or data types, sorry, you have 500 data types in one container, that's really cost effective. 500 containers would also actually work out to cost almost $20,000 if you do the maths. $37 for each container, you've got 500, that's just over $20,000. So there's another thing that we can do to make things a bit cheaper. We can actually share that throughput between all of our containers from the database level. So instead of provisioning performance per container, we can ask Cosmos, hey, I want, I've, I want this type of performance, but you direct it to which container needs it the most. So that's really cool. And all you need to do to get that is to check a box when you create your database. It's very simple. But if you already have a database and some containers without this ticked on, you actually have to start again. Think of it, they're running on an old version of Cosmos. So if you want to provision your database, or provision your throughput on the whole database, you have to start again. Now, there's other things that we have to look at uh, to balance our cost and performance. And one is we need to know how to write optimized queries and also how to properly design our partitions. And there's a few things that affect the, uh, the cost and performance of a query. Yeah, simply, the number of items we retrieve from the database and how big they are. So uh, it, it definitely makes sense to you know, narrow your queries down and be very specific to what you want to bring back from the database. Selecting star from your container, you and you don't need all those fields, if you only need two or three fields, be specific. Because you're going to get charged for the data and network I.O. to bring back the unnecessary information that you don't need. So you're wasting or using more RUs than you need to use. And also, writing really complicated queries, they take a longer time to compile. So <clears throat> if you have a lot of joins and operations in your query, you can actually work back and figure out the information that needs to change. And when the database, when you write to the database, you can write, um, and those particular items gets modified, Cosmos has a thing called the change feed. So any modifications to these items will trigger the change feed. It'll say this particular item was changed. And then you can actually do the complicated query and save the result in your container or in another container and obtain it with a much simpler query. So it's one complicated write and then you can have any number of very quick and easy, quick and simple reads. So uh, then the final thing to look at is the query metrics. So whenever you send a request off to Cosmos DB, you can obtain the metrics of how long this query ran for, how much time was spent computing it, how well did this actually run against the index? Because if your query metric says that you only ran 20% of your queries against the index, well that means you probably have a bad design in terms of your partitioning. So your, um, <clears throat> on the flip side, if it says you're utilizing the partition at 100%, that's like a direct lookup. It didn't have to scan the container to find your item. It knows exactly where it is and retrieves it for you. So you're saving a lot of time on the compute power and the disk I.O. So in terms of a direct get, this is the cheapest and quickest way to get your um, data back from the database. So if you know the partition key and the ID of the item that you want, Cosmos is going to charge you one single request unit per one kilobyte of data. So that's pretty cheap. And it's very simple to do as well. It's just one line of code. So with the, the new SDK, that's uh, one line. The old SDK, two or three lines to get this done. And just also to be aware, updates and deletes are very expensive compared to creating and reading the items. So a lot more work has to go into deciding which field for an item to update uh, same with the, the deletes. So we've got a couple of tricks that we can use. 
One is to use the idea of soft delete. It's not free, but super cheap. And instead of updating the whole item, we need to set one value on the item. Let's call it is deleted. And when we're trying to retrieve the item again, we just have to filter on the is deleted field and see how is it deleted, yes or no. Uh, if it is, don't return it. So, um, you know, it's a very simple update, it's one field, and we won't get it back ever. Our application will think it's not there. But it still exists in Cosmos. And how do we actually get rid of it from Cosmos? Well, we can set another field uh, called TTL, or the time to live. And Cosmos will actually expire this item for us for free. So if we give it a TTL of five seconds, five seconds after you set the value or the last modification time, it'll disappear. And Cosmos doesn't charge you. So yeah, you don't ever actually have to call the delete op operation, I think. This is a much better alternative. Now, when it comes to designing our partitions, we sort of think that one container that houses all our items, it can actually be broken up into a number of logical partitions. And the logical partitions is really what allows us to, or allows Cosmos to scale horizontally and provide us the, the high performance that uh, it promises. So, and it all be, uh, comes down to uh, choosing a good partitioning key. And just as an example, I'm going to explain how your account is structured. So for your database, you have one or multiple containers, and each of those containers will be backed by a number of physical partitions. And those partitions, we don't, uh, the physical partitions, uh, we don't actually have access to them directly. We don't control them. The Cosmos engine controls that for us by how we choose to structure our logical partitions <coughs> and the partition key. So inside of these logical partitions is then where our items are stored. So, yeah, what is a logical partition? How do you decide what is a good partitioning key? So I'll take an example of a car dealership. So I've got a collection of cars, and I've chosen body type as the partitioning key. But I know it's a bad choice, because if I look at the amount of data I have in my partitions, <clears throat> most of it is about sedans. And all my read and write operations are going to be about sedans. And because there's a limitation in Cosmos that you can only have 10 gigs of data per partition and maximum of 5,000 RUs per second throughput, very quickly, I'm actually going to run out of performance. I can't, uh, Cosmos can't break up this partition, give me more physical machines, and increase the performance or maintain the performance. So this turns into a hot partition. Now, application is going to get throttled uh, and possibly time out in some queries. So the application has to deal with that as well. So conversely, a good example might be to use the brand as the partition key. And this actually lets our data sort of you know, spread a bit more uh, evenly into the, contain into the partitions. And we can have more partitions. And Cosmos can use all its internal metrics to decide when and where to split it for us. So we can, in this example, you can see for each logical partition, we can have more physical partitions backing it up, more performance. So, a partition key with high cardinality, meaning it's got a, lot, a wide range of values, that's really going to help us get that good performance, that um, horizontal scalability. And how do you choose <coughs> a good partition key? Well, when you're designing your application and you look at the queries you've written, the one that occurs the most frequently, that's probably a good candidate to use as a partition key for Cosmos to index your data on. <coughs> so in this instance, I am uh, using the brand as my most frequent query. So that'll work. And you're trying to um, balance your reads and writes so that you can think, if I'm going to be writing only a few times to a, my container, but 80 or 90% of the times I'm going to be querying it, uh, choose the most frequent query. And in this case, it would be the brand. Uh, now, in the previous example, you can actually, over time, get more and more data in a partition and you'll have the same problem as uh, the same hot partitioning problem. So, how do you increase your cardinality? Well, now you can actually go and create a synthetic partition key by combining two or more fields together to form the partition. And even you could even spot this beforehand when designing your application by looking at your filters or the where clauses. If you're always filtering on multiple properties, you probably will need to use a synthetic partitioning key. And there is a way to migrate and solve the problem from one partition key to another partition with a different key. Uh, and you can utilize the change feed again. 
So any time a document is written to the original container, it can replicate that and store it into a new partition, or sorry, a new container with a different partition key. And over time, once they've all migrated, you can start querying the second container and throw the old one away. So in that way, you can maintain uh, your performance. Okay. So now we've looked at you know, uh, how to make Cosmos a bit cheaper, so by not doing unnecessary operations and uh, being able to make sure that our petition is always going to stay in a good state. And now looking at the any few ways to um, automate spend ops. <clears throat> And hopefully by now, everyone's sort of got an automated CI, CD pipeline. Uh, it's just the way we do things nowadays. And what we can leverage is our automated tests. And we hopefully we test our code and as much as possible of our whole application. So why not turn our tests into spend tests? Because our tests will be calling some sort of database, and in this case, Cosmos DB. And uh, you know, we can actually ask Cosmos, hey, how much did this query cost me that I ran in my tests? We can start measuring. But the problem is, nothing has built-in spend ops tooling for us yet. Um, and when we're looking at uh, the outputs for tests, everything is just concerned with the pass and fail, or how long it ran for, and how many branches this test uh, covered for us, the code coverage. And nothing includes how much it cost us. So we have to build this in. And once we've started collecting enough information, once we know how many RUs our tests uh, consume, if we map that onto our production usage and do some maths, we can actually work out a budget for next month's uh, spend. And we can actually avoid the bill shock. So we'll be definitely informed of how much we need. And then in terms of uh, provisioning, we can prevent under-provisioning and throttling our application. You know, we don't, we're not asking for enough performance, so we're going to get slowed down. Or we also have to then, or we can also then prevent over-provisioning so that we're not wasting money. So we've asked for too much performance. So we always want to say, stay in that Goldilocks zone. So the spend up solution is we have to instrument our applications and collect all the data that we can and also have it in a queryable state. So we can store it in quite a few places. You can use Azure Blobs, Tables, SQL, App Insights. You can put it back into another Cosmos DB if you feel like it, and a few other options. And we can take that information and feed it back into our DevOps lifecycle. So this is a very easy way to obtain the charge for each request. It's called a request charge. Now every request, response you get back from Cosmos, it'll actually tell you, hey, this consumed this number of request units. So we can actually use that and start collecting it um, by tagging our operations in our application with some sort of ID so we know where in our application this request came from. And um, one easy way to, to collect this is to use the request handler in the new Cosmos DB SDK, that middleware extension I mentioned earlier. Or my favorite, uh, the CQRS pattern. I write a lot of commands and queries, and they might have one or multiple requests to Cosmos DB, but I'm only interested in the overall request unit count instead of the smaller operations. So I can aggregate them sort of in each command and each query. And I'm using the mediated pipeline behaviors for that. So I'd like to show you a demo now of uh, Looking at some queries, I'll make some changes. I'll run, I'll commit the code, run some tests. And once those tests have run, I can actually surface the information in a Power BI dashboard to see how much change, uh, how many request units cheaper or more expensive my, uh, my code change was. All right. So. There we go. Oops, spoiler alert. Okay, so I've got an Azure Functions application here uh, to deal with my uh, dealership example. I have a few different endpoints for um, you know, finding the cheapest car and finding the cars with by body type and brand type and price. There's a few different ones. Okay, so um, I might try and modify the query that deals with Brand and body type. So here I've just got a simple query that compares the brand and body type. And I'm just going to add something. That Cosmos DB doesn't actually have a case-insensitive string comparison function. So we have to write our own. 
Okay, so I'm just going to go and do the old trick of making everything uppercase strings. Yep, add this one. We've got a bit of work to do here. And I'm going to actually try and make this query a little bit more complicated. I'm going to try and return my results ordered by pricing. There you go. Okay. All right, so you see I've got some changes here to the code. And okay. You commit this code, save that. And now, as soon as I push the code up to Azure DevOps, what we'll see happening is that my builds are going to get kicked off. And if we look at the build plan, I have a test step there. So in this example, I'm actually running against a real Cosmos DB instance. Uh, I can also run against the, the container, the uh, emulator. But uh, just for sort of you know, real life effect, I'll be using a real Cosmos DB instance. So our build's running. And while that's running, I might just show you, the application actually does work. And it is calling uh, a real code that goes to a real Cosmos DB instance. Because I've instrumented the application, when I run uh, you know, some REST uh, requests to my application, uh, all the logging and everything will surface into one of the tools, and you can see how it performs. Let's give it a moment. All right, so the Azure function's running. There's our endpoints that are available. So, for instance, here, um, here's one of the queries we modified earlier. I just need to open up one more window. Here's the logging. Okay. So as soon as I fire off this request, it should come back. It found one car. Cool. And here we can see also uh, the request units that was used was you know, 8.5. All right, cool. We can do some other queries. Again, same with these. This one, 3.6. All right, okay. So now, hopefully, uh, where is that one? All right, the build is run. Cool. So what I've done is, uh, in my tests, when they run, I intercept the request that goes to Cosmos DB, and just like this logging information I have here, I actually go ahead and store it in, in Azure Table Storage, in my case. You can store it anywhere else you like. And the way I store it, or intercept the queries, Show you here. Oh, I just have to stop the app. So when we create a Cosmos client, we can actually inject a our custom request handler. And in this case, I'm just calling it a request unit tracker. And it's a very simple implementation where we implement the Cosmos request handler, and it gives us a send async function with the, uh, the request unit coming in. So anytime I do a read or a write uh, to Cosmos or a delete or update, uh, that message will be intercepted here. And I can inspect the headers, I can modify the headers even. I can add in some uh, additional timing so I can measure my own latencies. And uh, also I can then uh, aggregate all the consumption data for my application, so, or running in the test in this case. And then I just go and log that information out. So this logger goes and stores this for me in table storage as well. And just a, an example of the data. Give it a moment. One more. 
So whilst the tests are running, I include information like the build ID, run ID, um, and the assembly name. You can include a lot more information, uh, whatever makes sense for you to identify that request, the origin from your application. So once we have that information, we can use something like Power BI and point that at, say, this storage, uh, table storage account and start plotting the data. So in this instance, I'm plotting via the uh, units consumed and the build ID and labeling each operation. So let's see, the latest build I have here is from uh, earlier today, which is actually the first build for the day. And in Azure DevOps, so here's the latest build, so dot two for today. And I'm gonna just refresh the, the, the data here quickly. And what we'll see, hey, here's a green line that spiked up. Oh, which one is this? Find vehicles by brand and body type query. That's the one we modified. So you can see those small little changes of um, using uppercase strings to convert the, uh, the um, comparison to case insensitive and adding the ordering by price, that has definitely got an effect on the number of units consumed. So whether it's in terms of the CPU or, disk net or network I.O., we can inspect that further by looking at the, uh, the query metrics. And you can plot that as well if you'd like to. But this is here, having a simple enough dashboard to show you, hey, someone made a change that's actually now consuming a lot more request units than we expected, you can go and say, hey, Liam, why did you make this query so expensive? <laughs> and then have a discussion. Let's see what we actually did. So we started by opening up Visual Studio and modifying some code. We pushed the changes to our repository, and that kicked off a build. Now that build then goes and starts up our unit tests. Now we can actually run that against a real or an emulated instance of Cosmos DB. The effect's the same, because we get our request charges, we can log all the latencies, query metrics, build information, whatever we need. And then we can go and persist that into some sort of consumption report. Again, you can use Cosmos DB itself, if you feel like it, table storage, SQL, or App Insights. Yeah, the choice is yours. And then we're actually able to plot that data and see the changes over time. Now, when it comes to then wanting to release our software, we can actually run an Azure function as a, a release gate. And that Azure function can query the re consumption report. And then we can make a decision. This change that Liam made, if it's 15% higher than our sort of set threshold, we can fail the release. And if it's underneath, we can go, hey, it's good, and release the software, deploy it to Azure. But then in the case of the uh, query that we modified being too expensive, we now have a spend bug. And then that can automatically go and create a work item in the backlog. And then we can make a plan to fix it. So we've completed the whole cycle for spend ops. It's pretty cool. And just some ideas for automating uh, spend ops even further and making it even better is uh, we can write our own test runners. And you know, in the case of uh, uh, MS test, we have a test context. So instead of only worrying about test or fail output, um, we can include the, the, the request unit charges as well. Uh, I, in my examples, I used XUnit, so you have to do a little bit more work. But in XUnit 3, we might actually be able to use what's called a test context um, and do the same thing. And we may not actually have to use an external storage to persist our test results. It can be directly surfaced in the normal test reports that we're all used to. And then in production, we can, uh, in the same way, instead of storing the results in table storage during our tests, we can uh, send all the information to App Insights. And we've got some pow powerful uh, analytic tools that we can use to, again, surface and monitor our data. And hopefully, one day, we can use Power BI to uh, uh, you know, directly draw that in our Azure DevOps, so the whole team can see this spending report. And uh, again, the request unit consumption report, we can use that as a release gate. Um, so something a bit more interesting would be to use machine learning to predict our demand. And uh, you'd have to probably spend a bit of time to get this model trained properly in different situations. But once we have the information to predict our consumption, uh, we can use an automatic uh, scaler that can uh, help our Cosmos DB have enough performance to always sort of stay in the Goldilocks zone where we're not over-provisioned and wasting money 
or under-provisioned and underperforming. So we definitely have some uh, suggestions for Microsoft to say, hey, please, can we directly draw Power BI charts in Azure DevOps? And currently, that have to open up in a window, or uh, uh, you have to use an iframe. It's a little bit, uh, bit clunky. But uh, another suggestion is if we can actually use Power BI directly in Azure Portal as well. So a different way of surfacing our data. And the, now, the future of spend ops, what that means for us is no more surprises. We'll definitely be more in control of our money and be able to spend it more effectively. And <clears throat> it's a very important thing because there are more and more consumption services coming uh, in the cloud space. So being able to monitor how much we use, how much we're going to spend, being able to plan is very important. It'll be very, very good for our businesses. And spend tests will definitely be part of our definition of done. You cannot release your software if it's going to have an expensive impact on your business. Uh, and with that, I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs>